Okay. This morning, uh, we're going to start talking about the clinical aspects of nasty headaches. So when I think of nasty headaches, I traditionally think of a few things. A couple things pop into sort of my differential, my category of nasty headaches, and those are bleed, meningitis, temporal arteritis, acute angle closure glaucoma, and then the one that we never see in California, but if there's anybody here from like Canada or somewhere where it ever gets below 60 degrees, carbon monoxide poisoning, right? Those are kind of the ones that are always circulating in my head as things I need to be thinking about. And I think that we all have our individualized algorithms and our approaches to the patient with headache. It's a really, really common chief complaint, and we know that they can have some life-threatening diagnoses, but most of them don't, right? That's just a fact. And the really difficult part is deciding who to chase, who to open that can of worms on, who to really go after and look for one of these nasty headaches, to look for the badness, and who to just say, I think this is a tension headache, I'm gonna roll the dice, I'm gonna take my chances, right? Because a lot of, the, and a lot of this chapter, I'll tell you, focuses around the big guy, subarachnoid hemorrhage. And a lot of the lectures you hear on subarachnoid hemorrhage, I think are highly focused on the workup. So what is the sensitivity of the test? How good is this type of LP? What about the duration after the headache? Those kinds of things. What this chapter was sort of written to do was it was trying to focus more on the pre and the post aspects of subarachnoid hemorrhage. So how to decide who to go after, right? Not so much the workup itself, but how to decide who to go after, and then if you diagnose a subarachnoid hemorrhage, is there anything new we should know about in terms of treatment that can help these people's long and short-term outcomes? So that's, this is sort of a pre and post chapter. Okay. And as usual, please interrupt me with questions. I like questions, and, and I like being interrupted for odd reasons. So question number one, what clinical features suggest subarachnoid hemorrhage? So, I think most cases that we've seen of subarachnoid hemorrhage all come in looking pretty much the same, right? It's a person who says, ah, I had a thunderclap onset of headache. Woke me up out of sleep, <laughs> right? Family member says they were initially looking fine, now they look a little bit goofy. They're altered, they're vomiting, they have asymmetric pupils, maybe they even have a focal neurologic exam. Most cases, subarachnoid hemorrhage look just like that, is that right? Of course that's not right, right? Most of them are very, very subtle, especially when you're dealing with these sentinel bleeds. If they all looked like that, this talk literally would take me about two minutes. It'd be very easy to say, a patient who looks like that, that's a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Anyone who doesn't look like that is not a subarachnoid hemorrhage. But that's not the case. The problem is that there is a spectrum of disease here. Now, there are some subarachnoid hemorrhages that actually do look like that, right? Where they come in, drop attack, they're down, they're vomiting, they're completely altered. You send them to the CT scan and they have a huge subarachnoid bleed. So there are some that look like that. And those are the easier ones to diagnose. The harder ones to diagnose are the ones who come in with very, very subtle clinical signs and symptoms and maybe even a non-concerning history. Now, are we gonna be able to catch all these patients? No way, impossible. So just get that through your head. We are gonna miss some. That's okay. Some of them are just too subtle to pick up on initial presentation. So let's go through some of these abstracts. So abstract number one kind of goes right to this. It's a JAMA article, and it says, initial misdiagnosis and outcome after subarachnoid hemorrhage. So this is almost 500 patients with a final diagnosis of subarachnoid hemorrhage 12% of miss, 12% of these patients were missed on first presentation. They came in for a headache and they were misdiagnosed. They were diagnosed with something else. They don't really go over the list of exactly what it is, but it certainly wasn't subarachnoid hemorrhage. And they presented to a variety of clinical settings with their headache. Maybe someone to their family practitioner, maybe someone to an urgent care clinic, but of the missed ones, about 40% came through the ED, right? So these are patients who came through the ED telling us they had a headache and we missed it. Why did we miss it? Well, like I said, it can be very subtle, 
the one critical point that this article makes, which every article in this section makes over and over and over again, one critical flaw was somebody sort of was suspicious and decided to open the can of worms just a bit and say, well, ah, I'm going to get a CT. CT negative, patient's looking a little bit better, and what do they do with the patient? Send them home, right? So this article makes the point, and every article in here makes the same point. If you decide to chase it, that this could be a subarachnoid hemorrhage, every CT needs to be followed by an LP. Every single one. No exception. And the reason for that is because of a statistical concept called spectrum bias. And what spectrum bias essentially means is that patient who comes in, drop attack, fell on the floor, asymmetric pupils, vomiting, the CT for picking up subarachnoid hemorrhage in that patient probably has a sensitivity of about 100%. Because this is a huge bleed to cause such a devastating clinical presentation. Whereas the patient who comes in with very, very subtle findings the CT is probably not that good. My guess is it's close to 50 or 60% sensitivity. Right? So relying on a test that has 50 to 60% sensitivity to rule out a horrible, devastating disease process is just not right. That's not good practice. And most of these articles say the same thing over and over again. Abstract number two. Please. Well, that's a good start. <laughs> Uh, well, I think you should be doing the LP. So I'm not, I'm not totally sure. So the question was, didn't I give the attorneys everything they needed to, what was the, screw you? It, it depends if you really, if you were working up now, so the question is, if you do a CT and not an LP, you're screwed, essentially. And I think that if your working diagnosis was rule out subarachnoid hemorrhage, you are correct. You are screwed. Right? Now, if it's something else, if a patient who comes in, it all depends on your charting. Right? If a patient comes in and says, you know, I've been having headaches, I've been having them for two weeks, they're worse in the morning, I've been losing a little bit of weight, and you're worried about a mass, and you get a CT, and that CT is negative, and they come back later, a week later, with subarachnoid hemorrhage, I think you're much more protected if your chart says, hey, I wasn't looking for subarachnoid hemorrhage. I did an appropriate workup for the disease process that I was looking for. Right? Because the truth is we can't do every test on everybody. I mean, that is the hard part of this pre-thing is deciding who warrants a subarachnoid hemorrhage workup. Right? So the question was, what about patient presenting in the first, in the first six hours with high-def CTs? You're talking about the new 64-bit scanners. So here's the situation. The new 64-bit scanners, at least on the initial studies, and see, every time I try to do this lecture, we get into the diagnostics. Damn all of you. So the new 64-bit scanners, the initial studies are small, but the sensitivity is definitely greatly increased from what we used to have before. That being said, it's still going to miss the really small bleeds. It is. Nothing is sensitive enough that we currently have in our armamentarium to catch those. My, like, no matter how awesome you're, if you have some new 128-bit scanner or something so cool I've never heard about yet, it still gets an LP. If your working diagnosis going in was rule out subarachnoid hemorrhage, we got to do it. Well, uh, so it's a good question. So the question was on the Newman article saying you have to do 700 LPs in order to find one subarachnoid hemorrhage that you missed on a CT. Uh, we don't go over that specifically in this chapter, again, because this isn't about diagnostic work of <laughs> this chapter as much as you want to try to make it. There is a question about that in the, in the panel. Like, there is an article that reviews that. Uh, and my, this, my counter argument to that would be that how many people in this room have seen a patient who you had a suspicion for subarachnoid hemorrhage, CT negative, you did an LP, and it was positive? Does that look like one out of 700? Not to me, right? We've all had this case. We have. Question. But even, 
but even though it's not a study, I hope everybody, everybody could hear what he said. I really like hearing information like that because that is real world experience. You know, it's not a study, but it's one either group or one ED's real experience of picking up 30 cases of subarachnoid hemorrhage in a year on LP that were negative on CT. But, yeah, and I think in my mind, all it takes is one. It takes one of those for an individual where you really think this is enough and you're like, ah, you're like on the fence whether or not to do it. And that's how you always are in these CT negative LP positive ones. You're like trying to convince yourself not to do this LP and you have one case where the LP comes back positive and it changes the whole way you look at this disease process. Or in your case, it sounds like you had 30 in your group and it'll change the way you look at rule out subarachnoid hemorrhage. But know that even in our new generation scanners, for me, there is absolutely no question about the fact that if you really think there's a subarachnoid hemorrhage there, that CT has got to be followed by an LP. It just has to. Um, in my five minutes that I have left. <laughs> but that's okay. Like I said, this always happens. We try to go the other direction. Because the diagnostics are really interesting to talk about for subarachnoid hemorrhage. So I'm going to go through this kind of quick abstracts two, three, and four all say relatively the same thing. They talk about this, this uh, concept of spectrum bias. They're looking at patients who are initially misdiagnosed, and they're saying that they all came in with relatively subtle first presentations. And if you are familiar with that Hunt-Hess classification, it's a very old classification that looked at sort of surgical risk of bleeding, actually, but it's sometimes applied to subarachnoid hemorrhage. These are sort of Hunt-Hess 0, 1 patients, so very, very normal exam, very subtle clinical findings. These are the ones we tend to miss, and these are the ones that we have to LP, even though we don't want to necessarily. Um, the next section is what clinical features, doesn't say tests, kids, what clinical features may suggest vertebral, basal, or artery dissection? So this is, I think, stuck in here just to kind of remind us that thunderclap headache doesn't always equal subarachnoid hemorrhage either. There are other things that can cause thunderclap headache. Some of those things are cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, tends to present with papilledema, maybe seizures, maybe a focal neurologic deficit, but papilledema is going to be your best for that one. And then dissections, uh, both vertebral and carotids, often occur with some sort of trauma, chiropractic manipulation, that sort of thing. Uh, the onset of headache in these two disease processes is usually gradual, but it definitely can be sudden onset like a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, and then in the following abstracts in this section, they just sort of review the signs and symptoms of vertebral basal artery dissection, and they remind us that common signs and symptoms include vertigo, unilateral facial paresthesias, cerebellar signs, visual field deficits here. I think the take-home point in this particular section is if you have a patient who has, who has sudden onset, bad headache, neck pain, and vertigo, you should think of vertebral basal or artery dissection and not subarachnoid hemorrhage. So this is more of a little clinical pearl here. The next one. Question. Thunderclap headache with sex? How many people have seen this case? Yeah, it's way more common than you think it is, you know? And what does it always sound like? like a subarachnoid hemorrhage. It sounds just like it, right? So the person, sometimes in more gory, lucid detail than you want, tells you exactly what was happening, uh, and then they have a headache, and boom, right? So the question is, I guess, left to us, can we blow these patients off? No pun intended. <laughs> Took everybody a second there. So, uh, but no, how frequently are these patients who come in with a postcoital headache do they actually have subarachnoid hemorrhage? Because they all sound just like it. And I would love to be able to tell you that the answer is zero. Never happens. But in reality, they do. And in this one abstract that's in this section, 30 patients who had postcoital headaches, two out of the 30 had some nasty cause of their headache. One was a subarachnoid, one was a dissection. So even though the timing of it sort of doesn't go along with what we'd like to picture as a subarachnoid hemorrhage, know that these patients have to be treated just like any other patient who comes in with sudden onset headache. Uh, the next question is especially important. Does a positive response to analgesia help rule out our diagnosis or does it just delay the diagnosis? And what do you guys think? Yeah, all it does is delay it, right? And this, 
This holds true for every disease process that we treat, right? It's easiest to think, I mean, because the truth of the matter is this. The only reason every conference you go to has so many lectures on subarachnoid hemorrhage, this being one of them, is because we just don't want to do it, is the truth of it. We have a patient, we're on the fence, we get a CT, it's negative, you've given them some morphine, and they're like, boy, I feel completely better now. I just like to go home. And then to sort of get up that gumption to go, God, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to like lay on the side and shove a needle in your back now, even though you feel completely better. It just doesn't sit well with us for some reason. But unfortunately, we have to do it, right? There's a series of abstracts here that all say the same thing, abstracts eight and nine, that this is a group of patients who got different types of medications. Some got narcotics, some got tryptans. They all had complete relief of symptoms, and they all had subarachnoid hemorrhage afterwards, right? But this completely makes sense. I mean, if somebody comes in with, like, a broken femur and you give them a bunch of morphine and you say, like, does it hurt anymore? They'll say, no, it feels better. Like, oh, great, I guess your femur's not broken anymore. You know, it, it doesn't, doesn't add up. But, but we try to use it for subarachnoid hemorrhage, but we can't. We just can't do that, right? So a response to analgesia cannot change our pretest probability of subarachnoid hemorrhage. It just can't. Question? Well, what would be the benefit? Yeah, waiting for what? But you're not LPing everybody who comes in the emergency room with a headache. You're only LPing the people who come in the emergency room with a headache that you have suspicion for subarachnoid hemorrhage. And that is not a large portion of the headaches, at least not what I see in my practice. Most of them are sort of chronic. They say, ah, my headache's been gradually getting worse over the last few days. I usually come in, they give me a shot of something, and it feels better. That tends to be the vast majority of the headache cases is the truth of it. You know, and I work at a teaching hospital where I'm supervising four or five residents at a time seeing a lot of patients, and I still don't find myself initiating a lot of subarachnoid hemorrhage workups. I think this is not something we do very often, so when we do it, we should do it properly. It just seems that straightforward. Well, I have two comments. So if everybody could hear him, he was saying, uh, gr granted, a lot of them are the chronic headache and the typical, but then you get the ones where I have really bad headaches, I've had bad headaches, but I've never had one like this before. This is 10 out of 10, this is the worst headache ever, and now you feel a little bit stuck. And I would say there are two ways to approach that patient. One is, and this gets into a larger discussion, of what to do with a nursing triage note that you completely disagree with, right? So if your clinical history taking an exam is different than that, then I would go based on what you find. And I would just clearly write in the chart, although this was documented at nursing triage, I had discussed these things in detail with the patient, and this is how she described the headache to me, and thus this is how I'm going to have my medical decision-making after that. But the truth is, if you take the history and the patient's like, look, I do get headaches all the time, this is not my headache. Right? This is something completely different, then you have to treat it like something completely different. You just do. I mean, I wish there was like a blood test or something we could send to rule out subarachnoid hemorrhage, but we can't. You know, a new, different, severe headache needs to be treated like a new, different, severe headache. It just does. And, and your point is, so for those of you who couldn't hear, the point was that, you know, we're taking the patient out of this discussion a little bit and saying, you know, if we have to do a CT and we have to do an LP, and regardless of what you want, like, kind of screw you. And that's definitely not what I'm trying to imply, right? But if you are sort of bargaining with the patient already, I'm not sure your suspicion of subarachnoid and hemorrhage is really that high in the first place. Right. If it really is high enough to go for it, then you need to go for it. You need to convince them to get this LP. That is an important part of the diagnostic algorithm. You just do. And if they're, of course, what the patient wants, and a lot of them may say, like, I feel better. You gave me some medication. I don't want this LP. Then you don't do the LP, you know. But we can't, and we document it. All we can do is what we know is right from a medical perspective. And I can tell you that every one of these abstracts in here, and we're spending so much time again on the diagnosis, we don't get to talk about many of them, but they're all, they all basically say the same thing, that it, you are going to miss a pretty good portion of these headache, of subarachnoid bleeds with these subtle patients. You, know, you just are going to miss them. So it has to do with your personal risk level and how risk-averse you are in terms of approaching these patients. And I can't really say, I, I agree they should be involved in the decision-making process, but at the end of the day, everybody in this room has to be the ones that know the literature, right? Because their decision-making process is going to be based on what we tell them their actual risk of subarachnoid hemorrhage is, and then absolutely include them. But if I'm going down the path, it's already starting pretty high, my opinion of what their risk is. Um, 
Okay, so the next question is, are there decision rules for evaluating the risk of subarachnoid hemorrhage in patients who present with headache? Well, this would be nice, right? Kind of like a nexus for subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, this is a really large study that basically tells us not that much. Uh, they give us three rules that we could use to determine who has a subarachnoid hemorrhage, and they say that all three rules work really, really great, and that's because all three rules say the exact same thing, and they say what? Just CTLP everybody, right? So if you read the criteria, uh, if you have any of these criteria for rule one, age greater than 40 with a headache, get CTLP. Complaint of neck pain, CTLP. Onset with exertion, CTLP. Rule number two, arrival by ambulance, CTLP. <laughs> right? So this is how you make a rule not miss any disease, is you just make the rules say test everybody, right? Because their specificity was obviously terrible. They had tons and tons of unnecessary testing. Uh, the next question talks about the risks of overutilizing advanced imaging, and this is a really interesting topic, actually, because what they're talking about here, the pros and cons, are, well, okay, what if I have a patient? And just so you know, it's interesting, because they're written as pros and cons, but they both say the same thing, is the truth of it. And this is a difficult clinical situation, where you have a patient where they say, they give you the perfect history. Now, they're relatively well-appearing, but they say, this headache came out of nowhere. I was having breakfast, and it felt, boom, like something exploded. Right? I've been feeling a little nauseous. I haven't thrown up. I have no other medical history except for hypertension. And this is a 45-year-old patient, and you're like, this is a subarachnoid, for sure. And you get the CT, and it's negative. And you do the LP, and it's negative. Right? And you go and talk to them, and you're like, you're sure it didn't start a little more gradual and kind of build up or whatever? And they're like, no, it came on out of nowhere, like a lightning bolt. This, like, and I've never had a headache before in my life. So what these pro and cons papers say is, what do you do with this patient? Where it looks like subarachnoid hemorrhage, it smells like subarachnoid hemorrhage, it sounds like subarachnoid hemorrhage, but the two tests we know to rule this out show that it's not subarachnoid hemorrhage. So what do you do? you keep going. That's exactly right. In this very rare patient, you keep going. And a CTA is a good option. An MRA would be another option. But in this particular patient, you need to keep going and look for that aneurysm. You need to find it. I had a case of this just within the last month where I was really, really surprised when the lady, I mean, she gave is exactly what I said. She gave a perfect history. I'm actually describing a real patient. And I went and talked to her myself after the resident was done. You know, sometimes you get a little different history, and I was kind of keeping my fingers crossed for one of those situations, and it wasn't that. She said exactly all the right buzzwords, and we did end up getting a CTA on her, and she had three aneurysms, not one, but three aneurysms that needed to be clipped. So uh, they actually got coiled, but what's that? Great question. So general population, a large portion of the people are going to have aneurysms. So how do you know that these three actually need to be coiled? In this particular case, it was easy because the neurosurgeon said so, right? <laughs> so, but a lot, a lot of it has to do with, hey, we work at a county hospital. We don't get paid that much. So a lot of it has to do with who the patient is in front of you. And this is why we can't skip the LP and go straight to the CTA in the first place which is because you're going to find a lot of false positives. And we're right back on the stupid <laughs> diagnostics. So. But that's why you can't go straight to CTA, because you're going to find a lot of aneurysms in the normal population. That's why we have to do the LP first to see if one of them is bleeding. So your point is very well taken. But that is a pretty rare small subset of a small subset of patients, but just know that you have to keep going. Uh, and the last section here uh, just talks about, are there any new therapies? So this is the post and if you guys ask me one more CT question, I'm not going to answer it. Uh, are there any new therapies once the diagnosis has been made that you can give these subarachnoid hemorrhages? I'll just sort of give you a spoiler alert. There's three things being tested here. None of them are really ready for prime time, but just so you know about their existence. The first one is looking at magnesium. They did a study looking at sort of delayed infarction, and the patients who got pretty big bullets of magnesium up front actually did have a decreased delayed infarction rate. Uh, but there is a large multi-center study going on now to look at this very thing. So I'd say this is too early. It's just some sort of food for thought. Um, the next one is just a very hot topic. So it's looking at tranexamic acid in patients with subarachnoid hemorrhage. 
And we've all heard about tranexamic acid recently because of what study? Crash, crash two, right, specifically. So the crash two study where they showed a decreased mortality in trauma patients who got this drug that basically prevents fibrinolysis. So they said, well, what if we give it to subarachnoid hemorrhage patients? And what they found here, this is a very small study, but they found a decrease in the size of the hematoma enlargement in patients who got tranexamic acid. Um, they didn't look at any of the bad things tranexamic acid can do, like cause clotting in other places, cause PEs, cause DBTs. Um, but I think you're going to start to read a lot more about this particular drug because that CRASH-2 trial was just so well publicized and all emergency medicine docs know about it. Uh, and the last one is just looking at statins uh, in subarachnoid hemorrhage. And uh, it's sort of a weird study where they say, yeah, they worked great. They sort of made people a little bit better, except that all the people who got it had tons of post-op neurologic deficits and sepsis. So... Uh, I would say don't give statins. Don't give anything new. Do what you do once a diagnosis is made, and which is, you know, call a neurosurgeon to help you, which I think is appropriate in this particular case. Um, there's one more abstract, and it's basically it says, in subarachnoid hemorrhage, besides neurologic dysfunction, what else can go wrong? This is letting you know, reminding you that with any CNS process, you can get pulmonary problems, so ARDS, uh, sort of massive pulmonary edema. This typically doesn't occur at the time of the subarachnoid hemorrhage. This isn't totally relevant to us unless you're working at a hospital in which you're kind of running up to the floor to do codes or something like that. I think just bear in mind, if you're going to a neuro ICU, know that you could be dealing with a patient with really, really wet lungs if they're having respiratory issues. So uh, I'm likely over time. Oh, I'm pretty close to on time.